Introduction to Neural Networks with C-Sharp, Class 12, Part 4. Welcome to Part 4. In this part, we're going to learn how to implement a training algorithm for a self-organizing map. Self-organizing maps are trained in an unsupervised manner, so we're giving it a series of input patterns and we're seeing which group it's going to classify them into. What we try to do in the training algorithm is make sure that at least one neuron is winning for each input pattern. We want to try to strengthen the neuron that is recognizing the input data and we will also want to try to make sure that there are no unutilized neurons in the output layer. So if there's a group that none of the input data is being classified into, we structure the weights in such a way so that it gets more evenly distributed. Because if we provided it with a, with say the 26 Latin characters and we have 26 groups, if not all 26 of those groups are being used, then something's wrong. Two characters are being put into the same group and we don't want that. We assume that if the operator gave us a certain number of groups, it wants, them, it wants us to use them. This is part of the training algorithm. We will now look at how we implement training for the self-organizing map. There are several components to training a self-organizing map. Such concepts as learning weight, the way that we update the weight matrices, how we evaluate errors, and when it is necessary to force a winner are all important considerations. We will look at each one of these concepts in detail in this class session. The learning rate is similar to backpropagation. It determines how fast the neural network is going to learn. Just like backpropagation, we must ultimately update the weight matrices. However, there are two methods that we can choose in self-organizing maps for how we update these weight matrices. They have different characteristics and can be used in different cases. We also look at how we evaluate error. This is an unsupervised training algorithm, so it's not quite as simple to evaluate error as it was with backpropagation. There's no standard that we're holding this to, so we can't simply use root mean square and compare it to the ideal outputs like we would have in backpropagation. Also, because self-organizing maps have a winner-take-all sort of strategy and a neuron must win, we must set it up so that at least one neuron wins with each training data and we also would like to utilize all of our neurons. If one neuron is consistently not winning, we'll force it to win. Learning rate is very similar to backpropagation. It's a percentage, so it is a number that is less than one generally. It determines to what degree the changes that we want to make are actually made to the weight matrices. Make this value too small and it'll take a long time to train your neural network. Make it too big and the neural network will act chaotically during training and fail to converge on anything. It's usually a case of trial and error to find a good training rate. Fundamentally, a self-organizing map learns by updates to its weight matrix. There are two ways that this course shows you to update the weight matrices for a self-organizing map. There is the additive method and the subtractive method. Generally, you will use the additive method. However, in cases where the additive method fails to cause the neural network to converge, the subtractive method may also be considered as a means of updating the weight matrix for the self-organizing map. Here you see the equation that is used to update the weight matrix for the self-organizing map when the additive method is used. The variable wt represents the weight of the winning neuron, and the result of the equation is the new weight. The variable x is the training vector that was presented to the neural network. The variable alpha is the learning rate that specifies the speed at which we want the learning to occur. This equation is used for the additive method, and generally the additive method is what you will want to use to update a self-organizing map. This is, when the, when the additive method does not work as well, you may want to consider the subtractive method. If the additive method is failing to converge and the error is not decreasing, then you may want to consider either a lower learning rate or using the subtractive method. 
Here you see the subtractive method. This is implemented in the code that is shown in the book. However, what we're doing is we're creating a variable called E that is going to hold the difference between the winning neuron's vector and its weight, and we are going to calculate the weight of the next iteration, which is the result of the second equation, by multiplying the learning rate by the E variable that we have just calculated. This results in the new weight value that we are going to apply to the neural network. You can see this implemented in Java code on the, in the book and also in the class notes for this section. Evaluating the error for a self-organizing map is somewhat tricky because the self-organizing map is trained in an unsupervised way. You can't just use root mean square and calculate the error as a difference between what we're currently looking at and the ideal rate as we would see. What we do is we assume that since we've been provided with a number of output neurons that these are the groups that we actually want the data to be divided into. We look at how evenly the data is being divided into these neurons and we see how effectively they're being used. If certain neurons are not being used, that's not good. We would like them to all be used because we assume that the training data that we've provided contain an example of each of the groups that we're ultimately classifying into. We adjust the weights in such a way to minimize the dependency on one particular group. We'll have some training cases where no particular neuron reacted particularly strongly to a given training set. In this case, we look at neurons that are underutilized already because they're not winning in other training set cases and we force these neurons to win. This allows us to more evenly spread the load of the winning neurons because we want to fully utilize all of the groups that we have provided the neural network with. And again, the groups are the output neurons because we present the input to the neural network, we evaluate the output neurons and see which one has the highest value. This is the group that the neural network has classified the input data into. By forcing a winner, we make sure that the total number of output neurons that we have been provided for this exercise are being adequately utilized for the problem at hand. This concludes part four. In the next part, you're going to see how to implement a simple example program that makes use of the self-organizing map that we developed over the last few class parts. We hope you will continue with part five. Thank you. This course is based on our Introduction to Neural Network Programming books for Java and also Introduction to Neural Networks for C Sharp. Available in both paperback and ebook format.